Hello there, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of the Homestead Journey Podcast, the podcast dedicated to the pursuit of self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. My name is Brian Wells. I'm coming to you from 3B Farm and Homestead here in beautiful upstate New York. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to join us on the Homestead Journey. This is episode number six. Thanks again for taking time out of your day to join us on the Homestead Journey. I hope this finds you well. I'm actually recording this podcast the Sunday after American Thanksgiving, and we have a snowstorm underway right now. They are forecasting, depending on who you talk to (laughs) or who you listen to, who you read, anywhere from 8 to 24 inches uh, is supposed to fall between now and next Tuesday. So in the next uh, 48 hours, that's supposed to be the accumulation. Normally a snowstorm like this is something that uh, really doesn't bother me too much. Uh, I've got that snowblower on the back of my tractor, 64 inch snowblower that just works wonders. But (laughs) uh, unfortunately I had two pigs slated to go to the processors tomorrow. I'm using a new processor that's USDA and then my 5A processor that's about a quarter of a mile away. And this is really wrecking havoc on those plans. Uh, I was able to reschedule the one for Thursday, but I have not been able to get in contact with the other processor. So I'm not quite sure how that's going to shake out since they are ones that usually the USDA processor Usually it's booking months in advance. So I'm not sure what the backup plan is going to be for that one. We will find out and I will let you know on next week's episode. But we did have a great Thanksgiving this week. I hope if you celebrate American Thanksgiving that you did as well. Uh, Also had a lot of homesteading activities that I am excited to share with you. So let's jump into this week's homestead happenings. As I promised on last week's episode, I would give you a full report on our turkey. Uh, I took a half of the turkey that we had smoked to work for our potluck on Monday, and then we enjoyed the other half of that turkey as well as a half of a fresh turkey that I brined for Thanksgiving. And let me tell you folks, it was wonderful. Now, my preference was the smoked turkey. Um, It was just out of this world good. In fact, the people at work, some of the people at work said that it was the best turkey that they have ever had in their lives. The brine turkey, the fresh turkey was good. Um, I didn't get it in the brine as well as I could have or should have. So the breast was a little bit dried out, but it still was very, very good. It was very satisfying to uh, have that as the main dish, shall we say, for our Thanksgiving meal, knowing that we had raised those birds. But we also had a lot of stuff on the table that came from either our homestead or my mom and dad's homestead. Um, Things like uh, carrots that we canned up. Uh, My mom and dad brought pickles that they had put together. Um, There was just a lot of stuff on the table that had come from either 3B Farm and Homestead or Hummingbee Homestead. And it's just very, very satisfying to sit down and enjoy a meal like that. And hopefully next year we will have even more because a big part of the Ruth Stout bed that I am prepping and that I am going to experiment with is going to be potatoes and sweet potatoes. So I am hoping that next year those vegetables will also be from our garden. The uh, second big thing that I did this week was I was able to finish preparing the Ruth Stout garden bed. So I was able to get some more hay and get all of that spread out just in time for the snow to come in and hopefully compact all of that down. And so hopefully that will be a great preparation for next spring. The uh, third big thing that we did this week is we actually ordered a case of beef 
through my father-in-law's work, uh, my father-in-law is a meat cutter and actually the manager of a meat department for a small independent grocery store in Pennsylvania. And so they had some beef on sale. My mom and dad and I, um, we went in on a case of beef. My father-in-law brought it up. And Friday, we spent the day uh, cutting up that beef. It was great to have my father-in-law here to help uh, trim it and to get it all cut up. And then my mom and I and my wife and I and my dad was here. My mother-in-law and father-in-law, we all pitched in, packed all of that into pints. And we ended up doing 71 pints, or maybe it was 70 pints of beef uh, in one day. And in fact, we had four canners going. And in about, well, I think it was um, about six or eight hours, we had all of that done. That was from the start of getting the beef out of the box to us turning off and cleaning up the last canner. I think I was done by maybe 4.30 or 5 o'clock uh, when it was all said and done. So we were able to pack a lot of work into um, one day and it was just a lot of fun to do all of that together. Working together it really took me back to when I was a child and we used to get together at my grandfather's house in the fall and we would do up corn. And it was just a big, huge, almost a party where we would do up corn. And then we would do the same thing with chickens. My grandfather would raise about 200 chickens and we would get together at his house on a Saturday and we would process a lot of chickens. Um, it was just a lot of fun. And so it was for us on Friday as we were to process all of that beef. And let me tell you something, folks. It is delicious. Oh, my goodness. We've already had two meals of it. We had a couple of jars that didn't seal right, and so my wife make, made up some uh, fajitas, and oh my goodness, it was so good. And then last night, um, we came home, we, were, we had gone out uh, and did some shopping, small business Saturday shopping, and so my wife cracked open a can of that, heated it up, we put it over some rice, and oh, it is so good good. So that's what we did on Friday. Also, and we're going to talk a little bit about this um, more in the Homestead Hack segment on this episode, but we did up some bone broth this week. I took the carcasses, the one that I saved from the um, potluck on Monday at work. I brought that home and put it in a fridge, kept that cool, and then I took the ones from Thursday, put them in my roasting pan, and let them cook down for I think it was about 72 hours. And then this afternoon, I canned all of that broth up. Oh, it's so good. It's so deep and rich and mm, so good. Um, while the beef was in the canner on Friday, I also spent some time reading through my seed catalogs. And that was very, very exciting uh, to start thinking and dreaming and scheming about next year's garden. And we'll talk a little bit more about seed catalogs and seed companies in an upcoming episode as we work through our garden series, but was able to get some of that done. Um, actually, the Fedco uh, seed catalog, which is very interesting. It's black and white, hand-drawn pictures. It's not as beautiful as the Baker Creek uh, catalog, which is just almost a work of art. But the Fedco catalog has really nifty um, interviews with people and some cool little sayings. It's just, it's a very different approach to seed catalogs. I really, really enjoy it. And then today, <laughs> today I did something that was not fun, but it is also very satisfying to be able to be self-sufficient on your homestead. What was it I did today? Well, Last night I went to bed early. I was just absolutely exhausted. And when my wife came in last night, she said, oh boy, the uh, septic started backing up into the basement again last night and I went ahead and cleaned it up. We'll deal with it in the morning. And so I kind of had my fingers crossed this morning. I told my wife to go ahead and try taking a shower. I went downstairs to keep an eye on it and sure enough, the water started backing up. So I Ran upstairs, told her to stop. We plugged the um, the tub to keep the water from running down. And we went ahead and went to church. 
And I'll tell you, it was very difficult today to concentrate on the sermon because in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, okay, I've got this stinky, nasty job ahead of me, and I'm really not quite sure what's wrong with this uh, septic system. Now, I had a bit of an inkling of an idea because we had this happen uh, about, I don't know, maybe two or three months ago. And what's happening is we put in a new toilet back in the spring. I did a bit of a remodel on the bathroom and we put in one of those water efficient toilets that's supposed to use less water per flush. But what seems to be happening is there's not enough flow to push things through the P-trap. And so while I was at church, I was hoping that's what the problem was because it's a relatively easy, I mean, it's a nasty, gross fix, but it's a relatively easy fix to unscrew the top of the P-trap and take a piece of wood or something and kind of fish the clog out and unclog it and whatnot. Um, but it's something that can be done in less than five minutes and then we're back in business. And so thankfully, that's all it was. Uh, and so I was able to avoid a big bill with my plumber um, because again, self-sufficiency I think is a hallmark of homesteaders and in this case, I was able to uh, clear that and uh, get things flowing again. So that's what's been going on on the homestead this week. A lot of great stuff and some stinky jobs, but thankfully able to get that moving. Very excited about having the uh, beef in the pantry and also very excited about the bone broth that we'll have in the pantry as well. All right, let's jump on over to this episode's Community Corner. Now, last episode, I was a little bit harsh on the online community. As you recall, I may have, well, I talked a little bit about the doubters and the haters and those who discourage us uh, sometimes on the online uh, forums and groups and so forth. And really, quite frankly, it's not just people online. Sometimes our family and our friends can discourage us and kind of make fun of us. And my goal in the last episode was not really to pick a fight with any of the online community, but rather just to encourage people to keep going even when the naysayers are doubting you or telling you you're doing it wrong or giving you bad advice. In fact, afterwards, I had somebody tell me that uh, the difference between hay and straw is that hay is the top part that they cut off to bale up for animal feed, and then straw are the stalks that remain 100% incorrect. Well-meaning individual, but 100% incorrect. And somebody in one of the Facebook groups, because I did post uh, a little bit of a follow-up to the pictures that I had put there and explained to people why I was doing what I was doing and, and explaining why I wasn't using straw and explaining why I wasn't using wood chips and explaining all of those kinds of things. And somebody said, well, people are just trying to be helpful. And I get that. I understand that people were trying to be helpful, but some people were just very either condescending in the way that they were trying to be helpful or the information that they were giving was just absolutely incorrect and bad. But anyhow, that was last episode. On this episode, I want to talk about how the online community can be very encouraging. And it was this week to me. Uh, as I posted pictures of our um, the, the turkey that we had uh, put on our table for Thanksgiving, and I posted about the beef that we were canning and the bone broth, uh, bone broth, that we were making. People were very, very encouraging about that, but people were also encouraged by it. You know, for me, sometimes it's easy to lose sight of the fact that there are people who don't, they're new to canning. And so they don't realize all of the things that you can do with canning. In fact, the guy that I bought the 921 off of, you may recall, was very um, intrigued by the idea of canning meat and so forth. He didn't realize you could do it, and he had canned vegetables for several seasons. But there were people who didn't realize that you could uh, can meat, and so I was able to encourage them, but also to provide them with information with regards to how to can beef, how to can chicken, um, and you know that these are great ways to store things in your pantry and not have to take up uh, room in your freezer 
and that it's something that is kind of homestead fast food. You come home like we did yesterday where you're kind of exhausted and you're, you know, you haven't really thought that far ahead. And my wife was able to, you know, in a space of a few minutes, pop open a can of that beef and warm it up and make some rice and bam, we had a meal. And it was really good. And so that's one of the things that I find very, very, um, you know, you kind of take the good with the bad. And last week I kind of focused a little bit on the bad part of the online uh, homesteading community. But this week I really enjoyed the good part of the online homesteading community where I was able to be encouraged, but I was also able to encourage and to inspire and to educate people and uh, that's something that's very, very rewarding. All right, let's jump on over to this week's Charting the Course. Now, we are in the second episode of a five-part series with regards to gardening. And last week, we talked about gardening methods and how they might impact uh, what you can plant and how much you can plant and why you might want to try one method or another, and my advice was to try multiple methods. This week, I want to talk to you about planning for the harvest. Now, that might seem like an odd topic in the second in a series on gardening. Why in the world would I be talking about the harvest when we haven't talked about buying seeds or starting transplants or planting the garden or anything like that? Why am I jumping to the end? Well, just like your gardening methods are going to inform you with regards to what you can plant and maybe how much you can plant. For example, you're not going to plant corn in a vertical garden. You're probably not going to plant squash in a vertical garden. Uh, your plan for the harvest is also going to help you determine what to plant, how much to plant, and when to plant. You see, there's a lot of things you can do with your harvest. When you, If you're new to gardening, obviously the first thing that probably comes to mind is you want to eat it fresh, right? You're, you're going to enjoy the harvest right from the garden to your table, sort of farm to table, but right in your backyard. And that's awesome. That's number one on the list. But sometimes you have an abundance of food. And so what are you going to do with that? Well, you may determine that you are going to just give it away, take it to church, take it to work, um, maybe put out a, a roadside stand and say free. Or you may put out a roadside stand and decide that you're going to sell uh, some of your overabundance. Um, but then you may decide, well, I want to preserve the harvest somehow. And uh, maybe you're going to do that through canning dehydrating, fermenting, freezing, or in a root cellar. All of those are great ways to preserve the harvest and depending on what you're growing. Uh, obviously, you're not going to take sweet corn and put it in a root cellar. It's not going to keep very long in a root cellar, but potatoes and sweet potatoes and onions, uh, things like that are going to, winter squash would keep very well in a root cellar. But all of those things with regards to uh, preserving the harvest, almost every one of those requires a certain investment in uh, infrastructure or things. And so you want to be thinking about that now because you don't want to have your tomatoes come on and in the back of your mind having decided, well, I'd really like to can tomatoes. And then all of a sudden your tomatoes come on and you have no canner, you have no jars, you have no lids. And oh my goodness, what am I going to do? As I said in last uh, week's episode, uh, this is a time of the year when many of us are writing out Christmas lists or we may be planning our budgets for next year. And so all of those things with regards to preserving the harvest uh, may require uh, some kind of an investment. And so you may want to either ask for those items for Christmas or you may want to be putting those items into your budget for next year. So let's just talk through some of these things with regards to maybe some of the things that you can do and how much it might cost you and how these uh, decisions may inform what to plant, how much to plant, and where to plant. So just thinking about eating the harvest, eating the harvest fresh, but even the preserved harvest, 
If your family doesn't like a particular vegetable, then I don't care how much garden space you have left or available, to plant something that your family doesn't like is a waste of garden space. Now for us, it has been onions. I do not care for onions when they are diced up and put into a chunky sauce or into a casserole or things like that. It's a texture thing for me. I, I don't, I've, I've given up trying to understand it. <laughs> but what I do know is that when I bite into an onion in a casserole, it triggers my gag reflex. Now, I don't understand it. I, again, I, I, I've given up trying to figure out why that happens. I just know what happens when I bite into diced onions or even diced peppers in a casserole. Now, my wife and I weren't married very long when she discovered the truth of this. When we got married, my wife didn't know how to cook very much. Um, my mother-in-law has always, it's always been kind of the kitchen was her domain, and so she never really taught my wife how to cook. So when we got married, I did a lot of the cooking, and Bonnie was trying to learn how to cook, and she's a very good cook now, but she really didn't know much about cooking at that point. And so when she was trying new recipes and trying to learn how to to you know, figure all of this stuff out, she was extremely sensitive about it. And she made this casserole. I don't, to this day, I don't even remember what casserole it was, but all I remember is it had diced onions in it. And I sat down with the best of intentions to try to eat that. And I, I it, it seemed like, I, I don't know, it seems like to me, uh, diced onions and casseroles are like bunnies. They just multiply. <laughs> it's it's nuts. Um, but I was doing my best to try to eat this, and I was tr you know pulling the onions out just little by little by little, and uh, and trying to choke it down. And and she got so upset, and I'll never forget. She just had this meltdown. She was crying over this, <laughs> and we laugh about it now. But it certainly wasn't funny then. All of that to say. We don't use a lot of onions in cooking now. My wife, whenever we go to make a casserole and it calls for onion, she usually substitutes onion powder. Now, there are certain dishes where, like we'll do beef and onions and she'll cut up onions into rings and she'll kind of saute them. I'm all about that. Um, if you take onion rings and put them on pizza, I can deal with that. If you dice them up and hide them under the cheese, then at that point all bets are off. But if they're on top, I can see them it, it doesn't bother me. I enjoy them. You take an onion and you cook it with a roast and it's whole. I love it. But uh, you dice that up and put it in a casserole and I'm tapping out. Again, I've given up trying to understand all of that. But the point is, onions for us is really a waste of garden space. And yet for years, I insisted on planting onions. Now, I put onions in my salsa and things like that, so it's not like it was a total waste of space, but I didn't need to plant as many onions as I was planting. This year, I did not plant a single onion because I learned that I need to plan for the harvest and that if I don't enjoy eating it, then it's probably a waste of space in my garden. And I don't know what that is for you, but just be careful when you are thinking about your garden and you're sitting down and you're planning out for the first time. If there's a vegetable that your family has never tried before, then maybe you want to plant just a few of whatever it is. For example, all the rage right now is kale. And some people like kale and some people don't like kale. It doesn't seem like there's a whole lot of a middle of the road. My family happens to enjoy kale. A lot of people don't. So if you've never tried kale before, your family doesn't care for kale, then planting an entire row of kale is probably a waste of garden space. So you just need to think about that and plan accordingly. Now, if you're planning on giving away your produce, you need to also think about, is it something that people are going to want? Now, this was a lesson that I learned the hard way. <laughs> In 2007, when we moved back here, my grandfather had already had the garden planted for us. In 2008, I took over. And so I went down to the local uh, feed store and I bought uh, all kinds of different vegetables to plant as transplants in the garden. And one of the things that I bought were, was a six pack of zucchini. 
Now, I've since learned that I can start zucchini from seed, and it's a very easy vegetable to grow, although, like I shared, I think, last uh, episode, I've struggled the last three years to grow zucchini, but that year, I bought a six-pack of zucchini, and I brought it home, and I planted every blessed one of them, and my grandfather kind of chuckled, and he said, Brian, are you sure you want to do that? Well, I'm cheap. And if I buy six zucchini, I'm going to plant six zucchini. <laughs> and so I did. And we had zucchini out our ears. Now, we made zucchini relish that year. We made zucchini bread. We made zucchini pickles. We fry, uh, fried zucchini. We grilled zucchini. We baked zucchini. We got sick and tired of zucchini. But one of the things that I came to understand is it's very difficult to give those suckers away because everybody grows zucchini. In fact, the running joke is that in Vermont, the only time people lock their cars and lock their houses is during zucchini season. And I learned that the hard way. So uh, obviously we're in upstate New York, but the same holds true here. And uh, so I think it was mid-August, I was out pulling up zucchini plants because I was tired of zucchini. What was it? I had failed to plan for the harvest. Now, if I was deciding to sell things by the road, I probably could have sold some of that zucchini, the, the younger stuff. It, it, the bigger stuff is what you can't get rid of. You can't give it away. The young tender stuff people like to grill and, and so forth. And you can sell that with some success. Uh, that and summer squash, but uh, again, if you're wanting to do that, that's going to be your plan, then you might want to plant eight or ten zucchini, but if your plan is to give it away or to eat it fresh, that's probably too much unless you have like 13 kids. So not only will thinking about the harvest help you think about what to plant or how much to plant, but it also can help you understand when to plant. One of the things that you are going to learn if this is something that's new to you and you're new to gardening is that the harvest will not wait for you. When it is time for the harvest to come on, it is going to come. When the tomatoes are going to ripen, they're going to ripen. They're not going to wait for you to get back from vacation. They're not going to wait for you to uh, get through fair season. Um, when the harvest is coming, it's coming and that's you've got to deal with it. Now, we have not always done very well thinking about that. And so I have had beans come on during fair week. And so we would come home from the fair and be up until 2 o'clock in the morning canning beans. Uh, I haven't calculated well and had to harvest come on while I was on vacation. So you need to think about those things. And on your seed packets or your transplants, usually they will have the number of days to maturity. And so when you look at that, now that's a general guideline. Obviously, depending on the weather, things might come on a little earlier, come on a little later. But it does help you plan for the harvest if you're thinking ahead by looking at those dates. And if you know that you're going to be on vacation the first week of September, then you're going to try to get your maybe tomatoes in the ground so that they're not coming on that week. Maybe you get them coming on a week later. Uh, if you can. So planning for the harvest is going to help you understand when to plant. Now part of your plan for the harvest may be to preserve it and I certainly would encourage you to do that and you can do that as we said through a variety of different methods canning, dehydrating, fermenting, freezing, or storing things in a root cellar and those are things that you're going to want to think about now because depending on what you decide to do with a harvest is going to again help you understand how much you should plant. Uh, maybe you are going to uh, plant extra tomatoes because you want to make tomato sauce or you want to make stewed tomatoes, um, which is something very easy to can. Those are things that you can do in a hot water bath canner. You don't have to invest in a pressure canner or jump into that if this is something that is new to you. Again, you don't want to wait till the last minute to purchase that item. Wait till the tomatoes are coming on and be like, oh my goodness, I need a canner. Now I've got to run down to Walmart or the hardware store or something like that to get it. No, most of the hardware stores and probably Walmart uh, and other places will have those in stock. 
But if you think about it now and you start looking on Craigslist or Facebook Marketplace, you may be able to pick up a hot water bath canner uh, for a lot less money. You may be able to pick up a pressure canner at a yard sale, at a flea market, at a uh, junk store, um, on Facebook Marketplace, on Craigslist. As I've told you before, I have had good luck with that. I was able to buy a 921 and a 930. A 921 I found on Facebook Marketplace. A 930 I found at an antiques and flea market uh, thing that they have at our fairgrounds every spring and fall. Uh, I've heard of people finding them at yard sales, at junk stores, at Goodwills, at Salvation Armies. And so you want to be keeping an eye out for things like that right now so that you are well positioned for preserving the harvest next season. And you may be able to find uh, jars at yard sales. You may be able to find them again on Craigslist and Facebook Marketplace. Whatever you can do to minimize the amount of your investment, uh, at least from my perspective, is the best way to go. Sometimes you're going to need to buy new, uh, and that's certainly not a bad thing. But at least from where I sit, I want to do that as little as possible. Maybe you want to try your hand at fermenting food. You maybe want to make sauerkraut. You can do that in mason jars. You can get a special tops that are a one-way valve. Or you may want the glass weights that will help hold all of the uh, vegetables underneath the brine, which will keep things from molding. And those are things that would be great to ask for for Christmas because they're not really huge dollar items, um, but are things that maybe somebody might want to, you know, spend 20, 30 bucks on you. And so the glass weights, the, uh, the, the tops for the mason jars would be a, a great Christmas present. You can also get fermenting crocks, um, which might be something else that you might want to ask for for Christmas or put into your budget. Those cost a little bit more. I've not used them personally, but uh, people swear by them. And so that might be something that you want to invest in. Uh, maybe you want a dehydrator uh, or you want a vacuum sealer. Um, those are things, again, that you can find on Facebook and Marketplace on Craigslist, but are also great gifts that you might want to ask for for Christmas. If you're planning on freezing vegetables or freezing meat, then you may need to invest in a freezer. And again, those are things that you can find on Facebook Marketplace, on Craigslist. I, I kind of feel like a bit of a broken drum here, but I think sometimes people forget that you can find these things relatively at a great deal on those sites and save yourself some money. Now, the one that is going to require a bit more planning and a bit more of an investment is a root cellar because a root cellar, depending on what you have as far as a setup, that may require some construction either in, in your basement or an unheated portion of your garage, or you may need to dig something out. Um, and so that's going to be something that you're going to need to plan ahead on. Because as far as I know, that's not something that you're going to find on Craigslist or Facebook Marketplace. And so you may need to build something in your basement or an unheated portion of your garage. Um, you may, to do, may need to do some excavation. But if that's the way that you are going to preserve your harvest, then you want to be thinking about that now so that you have that root cellar in place when your harvest comes on. So... That is it for this week's Charting the Course. Be thinking about your plan for your harvest. Plan for the harvest now before you ever buy a seed, before you ever buy a transplant. Know what you're going to be doing with that harvest. That will help you understand what to plant, how much to plant, and when to plant. All right, let's close out this episode with this week's homestead hack. And this week's homestead hack is really an easy way to make bone broth. Now, for the last couple of years, we have made chicken stock or broth using the backs from our hens that we have dressed off. I have cooked them down, and I have canned up that broth, uh, and we have enjoyed it immensely. But one of the things that I have missed out on 
is taking the carcasses from chickens or taking the carcasses from turkeys and cooking those down and making broth as well. And it's really, really easy to do. And it's not something that you have to do right away. If you don't have time or maybe you had a small chicken and there's not really a lot of bones uh, left to, to kind of cook down, you can take that carcass and wrap it up and put it in the fridge if it's going to be something that you're going to deal with in maybe the next week. Or you can put it in the freezer and then pull it out when you have accumulated a bunch of them. And it's really, really easy to do. All you do, you unthaw that or if you're just going to do it right away like we did this week, you throw it right into a roasting pan, an electric roasting pan, or a crock pot. You add some liquid, and then you throw in some seasoning. So you might want to throw in some celery, some onions, some carrots. Uh, if you like thyme and um, rosemary, you might want to throw that in there. My wife doesn't care for rosemary, so I left rosemary out. And then it's just low and slow. You let it cook down. Some people let it cook for 48 hours. Some people let it go longer. Uh, whatever kind of floats your boat. I push it to 72 hours this time, and I have this really, really rich, dark uh, broth. And then you can either freeze it or you can can it, and you have an awesome base for soups and stews, or you can use it to cook rice, or you can just drink it straight up. It's certainly something that if you are fighting off a flu or a cold, it will help you feel better quickly. Absolutely love the stuff. And so that's what we did on the homestead this week. Threw all of that stuff in my roasting pan and cooked it down, canned it up. Very, very easy to do, but you don't have to can it. You can freeze it uh, and it will keep. And then you can just pull it out and use it for soups and stews or just drink it straight up and I think you will enjoy it. All right, folks, that's it for this episode of the Homestead Journey, the podcast dedicated to the pursuit of self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. If you've enjoyed what you've heard, or even if you haven't enjoyed what you've heard, I'd love to hear from you. You can reach me at the Homestead Journey Podcast at gmail.com or pop on over to our Facebook page, facebook.com slash the Homestead Journey Podcast. And if you haven't already, I'd really appreciate it if you'd leave us a review on your favorite podcasting platform and also share it with other people that you think might enjoy what we're doing and might be encouraged on their homestead journey. Until next time, everybody, keep up the good work.